This is Ed Petke with the Americans in Wartime Experience. Today's date is September 25th, 2022, and I'm conducting an interview with Mr. William Hyden at Noakesville, Virginia. Sir, would you please tell us uh, your name and where you were born? Uh, my full name is uh, William Thomas Hyden. I go by Tom. I was born in uh, Arlington, Virginia. Okay. Did you grow up in, grew up in Arlington? I, uh, I lived in and around Arlington until I was about seven years old, and then uh, my mother and myself and my younger brother uh, all moved to the mountains of southwestern Virginia where my mother was from. And I spent time, spent time growing up in the mountains until I was like a, a junior in high school, and I came back to northern Virginia and been back ever since. So, so as a kid growing up in the mountains, Good experience? I mean, for kids, yes. that's the best. Well, it, it didn't seem like it at the time, but in reflection, uh, it was it was kind of a, a shock to the system for a city boy. Uh, mm -hmm. After having lived in, in the Washington metropolitan area for, for you know, seven years, mm -hmm. uh, the first house I lived in when we moved to the mountains, I had to take a bucket and a dipper and go to the spring and pass the outhouse to bring water back to the house. I mean, it was a little different. Rural, <laughs> yeah, culture shock. Yep. Awesome. And what war did you participate in, sir? Vietnam. You have any other military veterans in your family? Uh, I have a younger brother who uh, did 20 years in the Army and retired as, a, as an Armor First Sergeant. So back in, I guess, the late 60s or mid-60s, you, you, I guess, you know, old enough, you, you see things are brewing on the horizon. Well, yeah, I mean, you're starting to see um, you know, a lot of news media on the, on the TV in the evenings and so forth about what's going on in this place called Vietnam, and you don't really, you know, teenager, you don't think about it, you know. So. Had never ever heard of Vietnam before that? No, no. Um, did, were you able to see images and what's going on on TV at that point? And oh, yeah. yeah what were your was, thoughts about that? Well, it was, uh, it was just one of those things about, um, you know, just felt sorry for the individuals having to participate in something like that and uh, but again you know young and dumb and uh, being being in your teens and wanting to just get out and run around and enjoy yourself you just you, you don't really dwell on it right and uh, what, what were the uh, circumstances for you entering military service oh man I was um, um, Arlington local board was my draft board and you know, I received my uh, my notice to go for a draft physical and had to meet uh, at, at the local board in Arlington and be bused down to Richmond, Virginia for uh, physical and so forth. And, mm -hmm. and uh, of course, I was pretty pretty nervous about that. So you, I remember standing in a line of guys and the doctor coming along with a stethoscope and he'd kind of hitch in a couple of places and move on to the next guy and he hit me in a couple of places and went to the next guy and then he, he backed up and he hit me again and hit me again and, you know, check it and he says, hmm. To make a long story short, uh, at the end of the day, I, I was kind of uh, had a deferred qualification. Uh, they, they thought I had a heart murmur or something. And, mm. and so, you know, catch the bus on back home that evening. And a few months later, I get notified again to come down for another physical. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, time, this time they sent me out to a, a civilian clinic to a heart doctor and he examines me and he says, he says, boy, there's nothing wrong with you but your nerves. <laughs> You're one A. You're, you're <laughs> right. <laughs> so kind of, kind of interesting. I mean, I guess when they send you home, are you thinking this is it? I'm, I'm not going. No. Well, yeah. In, initially, time. I yeah. thought, wow, is there really something wrong with me that I don't know about? Right. Yeah. You know, but then, but then it all got cleared up. <laughs> as it did in those days. <laughs> yes, as it did in those days, and then. Um, uh, then, you know, when I was 19 years old, I got the official draft notice, you know, greetings from the president, you know, which I still have. <laughs> We're going to send you on a, a whirlwind tour of faraway lands. Yep, yep. And you still have that, you said? I do. I do. I'm kind of a, kind of a pack rat in that mm -hmm. regard. I've got copies of most every order that, uh, you know, I ever was <laughs> affiliated with. Mm, interesting. That's cool. Um, so if, had you not been drafted, did you have any military aspirations at all before none, that? None whatsoever. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I grew up poor, and all I was worried about was, you know, getting out of high school and getting a job and making some money, and, and uh, I had a girlfriend, and, uh, and matter of fact, by the time I was drafted, I was engaged, 
and uh, out of high school I went straight to work for the local telephone company which in our area back in those days was CMP Telephone. Mm -hmm. And so uh, straight out of high school I went to work for them and I'd, I'd been working with them a year uh, by the time I had to leave and go into the Army. And okay. So no, I had no, no aspirations of the military. <laughs> <laughs> they kind of made that decision for you. Yes. So where did you work uh, and then go into how do your basic training at? Oh, yeah, that was fun too. They, uh, <laughs> they, uh, <laughs> I ended up in Fort Benning, Georgia in July and August. It was uh, really warm down there at that time of the year, a place called Sand Hill. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I did my, my two months of uh, basic training at Benning and uh, next thing I know I graduate from, from there and they say I'm going to be assigned to the infantry and they uh, they put me on a bus and send me straight to a place called Fort Polk, Louisiana mm -hmm. for advanced infantry training. Uh, you get to Fort Polk and they got these big signs that says, uh, welcome, the home of the infantrymen for Vietnam. Uh, <laughs> so you, no, no, no delusions of what, what was going on next? None whatsoever. So you go down to Fort Benning and it's hot, you then go down to Louisiana, mm -hmm. and you really found out what hot was, didn't you? <laughs> well, at least at least that was by the time I hit Polk, it was uh, middle of September, so it was starting to cool off a little bit. So. Okay. Okay. But still, it was just a different uh, environment, you know. Right. The armadillos running around down there all the time. <laughs> so you go in, and they say you're going to be an infantryman, which at that time, going over to Vietnam, most everyone was probably going there, at least initially. Um, did you did you stay an infantryman or? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, so what what was what was what's the training for an infantryman like down back in in the sixties? Well, it was uh, it was very realistic. Uh, uh, the the main th the main thing I took away from my infantry training at Fort Polk was just how easy you could die. Okay. I mean, we went out and we did live fire exercises. We ran patrols. We set up ambushes. We we searched mock villages. Uh, we went out uh, on like a bivouac with aggressors. I mean, it was it was pretty intense uh, mm -hmm. in, in that regard. Yeah. I guess you know. I mean, almost like you know, they they already knew what it was going to be like. Might as well let you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because this was uh, you know this was the summer of '67, so okay. things have been going on for a while. Mm -hmm. but, uh, so all right, so. After you, you get done with, with Fort Polk, mm -hmm. um, do you go straight over? Nope. I got a, uh, I came home on a 30-day leave, Okay. Uh, married my fiance, okay. and three weeks later I reported on Pearl Harbor Day mm. uh, to Fort Lewis, Washington to ship over. How'd you get out to, to Fort uh, Lewis? Uh, you know, we, we just you flew we out. bought a ticket and okay. flew out to uh, Seattle and, and then reported into Fort Lewis on December the 7th. Wow, my my day of, my day. day my day of infamy. <laughs> yeah, yes, absolutely. So, what what did you? Uh, how long did you stay out there in Washington? Uh, just a, just a few days. I, I reported in on the seventh of December, and I think I I got into Vietnam on the tenth. Okay. So, what what are your first thoughts? Well, for, what what's your thought getting onto the plane in Washington to go over? Oh. Scared to death. <laughs> yeah. I mean, was this a flight with just just soldiers? No. Or? Well, yeah, it was just soldiers, but it was a, it was a, um, a like a charter, but it was mm. it wasn't a military plane. It was a civilian aircraft with stewardesses mm. and a whole bit, but it was all chartered military. It flew out of McCord Air Force Base, which is adjacent to Fort Lewis. Okay. And how long is the flight over there? Uh, or did you stop anywhere in between? Oh yeah, we we made a stop in Hawaii, uh, Wake Island. Mm. Uh, Guam, and then we flew into Cameron Bay, South Vietnam. Okay. Any any chance to just kind of look around when you hit those little jump spots, yeah. or was it kind of up and down? No, no. We uh, we were able to deplane and and you know stretch out and mm -hmm. everything. I remember uh, you know Honolulu with the uh, uh, Christmas lights on the coconut palm trees and stuff. <laughs> I thought that was pretty cool. Right. <laughs> whole, whole new. Yeah. De de definitely definitely mm -hmm. a shock. I'm sure. Yeah. All right. So you got into Vietnam. What? What, what's your when you land? I mean, you land, the doors open, you step off the plane. Mm -hmm. What what's what are you thinking? What what's what's your immediate thought? What's your thought of Vietnam? Well, it was it was it was kind of a mixed. Uh, when we got when we got to Vietnam, it was after dark. I don't have a clue what time it was, but it was after dark, and and you got off, and it was hot and humid, and 
And I remember, I remember, you know, as we were landing, I'm thinking, wow, this place is lit up like a Christmas tree. I thought there was a war going on. You know, what's what's all these lights and stuff? But that's just the way it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you know, the airport there had a, a lot of uh, a lot of civilian people and a lot of uh, South Vietnamese military people, and you know, walking around with arms and all that. Yeah, I mean, it's just. It's just you know it's just kind of mind numbing sometimes, uh, right? And then and then they they bust us to uh, the uh, uh, the depot there, which is like a, it was a replacement station is what it was called, the mm -hmm. replacement station for process in processing and uh, to be further deployed. And and mm -hmm. one thing was kind of unusual too. I, I had been told uh, typically uh, when when all of us trainees you know graduated from uh, infantry AIT. Uh, our orders were cut, just basically sending us to a replacement station for further assignment. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, uh, the group that, that I graduated with uh, had an APO number on the orders, mm -hmm. and uh, that's the Army Post Office, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, at that time, you know, we're asking the cadre, says, "What is what is this? What is this it? What is this number? What does it mean?" And they, oh, you're going to the first calf. Right off the bat, it says mm. you're going to the first cab, and that's where I ended up. Do you have any idea what the first cab was before yes. you heard that? Yes, I okay. had. Um, it, <laughs> it's kind of stupid, but <laughs> <laughs> when I was in basic at Benning, uh, one of my drill instructors was a was a buck sergeant who had served in Vietnam and served with the first cab, and of course he had this bright yellow cab patch on his on his shoulder, mm -hmm. and I thought, my God, I like that patch. <laughs> I, I don't know nothing about them, but I think I'd like to have one of those, and <laughs> darned if I didn't end up there. <laughs> what you wish for, right? <laughs> And it is one of the more iconic, recognizable patches. Uh, one of the largest, um, largest patches in the army, and, right. uh, and it's got a lot of history associated with it. I mean, a lot of people don't realize uh, what what the first cavalry is or is comprised of, mm. which is the old West cavalry units. Uh, famously, uh, Custer, Custer, George Armstrong Custer, mm -hmm. Seventh Cavalry, Seventh Cav is part of the First Cav Division. Yeah, you know, I was in the Fifth Cav. Fifth Cav at one time before the. Uh, before the Civil War was commanded by Robert E. Lee. I mean, he had a 12th Cav. Yeah. They mm -hmm. were, you know, a lot of Indian fighters out west. All, you know, all those units made up the 1st Cavalry Division. So. A lot of history to kind of own up to and, and kind of measure yourself up to and say, you know, yeah. part of something that's been, you know, it's not just something that was just formed. Right, no, it, it had a lot of history. Because served in World War II, served in mm -hmm. Korea, and, and uh, by the time uh, I joined them in Vietnam, they were the only air mobile infantry division in the Army. Mm. Uh, helicopters were our horses. Had you ever been on a helicopter before that? No, no. So, and and not not knowing that you were going there in your basic training, you didn't have any helicopter experience during your training. It was almost trial by fire. Hey, here's a helicopter. Get on it. We're going. Mm -hmm. Well, when we uh, when I got to my division in Vietnam, uh, they had some in country training, mm -hmm. and one of the things we had to do in our in country training was uh, was climb a tower. And, and get all cinched up and repel off of it as if we were repelling out of a helicopter. Okay. Uh, I never had to repel out of a helicopter, but I, I sure jumped out of a lot of them. Yeah, no <laughs> I mean, doubt, no doubt. I mean, because they didn't, typically they didn't sit on the ground. You, no. you, you, they, you just got you out, quick. out quick. <laughs> yeah. So, so what, what, so aside from repelling, what, what's, what's your, what's your CAV training like when you get over to Vietnam? What else are you doing? Uh, the only other thing I really recall in the in-country training was, uh, was some, uh, we had to go out and, uh, uh, and they talked about booby traps and, uh, we had to go out and spend a night outside the wire and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, just, just some basic stuff, Yeah. Okay. So how, how long how long was your in-country training for this? Um, it couldn't have been more than a, you know, from the time I, I hit the CAV until I joined my unit in the field, it couldn't have been more than a week. Okay. Uh, you know, the whole processing thing. So and break I, down I, and dirty. Yeah, yeah. It is. yeah I, I and I joined my unit uh, in the field uh, either one or two days before Christmas, 1967. Okay. And they were uh, they were uh, actually guarding a bridge at a town called Bong San in the Central Highlands on, on Route One. Okay. So you get. So obviously, you know, you, you get on your helicopter, you're going out there. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you think, all right, this is it. Training's over. I'm going out. What yep. are you thinking? Mind-numbing. Mm -hmm. Just just absolutely mind-numbing. You just, you have no... Does it feel real? In a sense, no. It's, 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 sometimes it's almost like it's, it's a dream or something. I mean, it's... Mm -hmm. Like, how did I get here? What am I, you know, I'm... Yeah. Oh, a couple of weeks ago I was sitting home and now I'm... Mm -hmm flying in a helicopter over a jungle. Yep, yep, that's about it. Okay. So you said you were 5th Cav? 
Yeah, second second battalion, fifth cavalry. The Black Knights. Black Knights. Okay, so when you get to your first, now are they calling them fire bases at this point? Are they calling them? Well, uh, yeah, fire base. Yeah, refer to them as fire bases or LZs. Okay. And, so you get to uh, your first LZ. So we had a battalion LZ, which I processed three before. Yeah, when I got to my battalion LZ, okay. I guess that's where I was finally uh, like issued a weapon and, okay. and, and those types of things. Okay. Uh, and then from there, I was choppered on out to the company that I was assigned to, okay. and which was, like I say, guarding that bridge. Okay. So y you get there, and what, what, what do they tell you? <laughs> you know, find somebody to buddy up with and make a hooch okay. <laughs> to sleep in. <laughs> and, and, and you did just that? I, I did just that, yeah. You did a lot of digging, I'm sure. Well, there, there. there we did, well, yeah, we did a lot of digging, but not, not, not at the bridge. I mean, yeah. we just, you know, took... And, it was already and, established and, when you got there. Yeah, yeah, and, and what I'm referring to as a hooch is uh, uh, you would take your, uh, your ponchos. Mm -hmm. You were issued a poncho, so you know, usually you'd buddy up with somebody and you'd, you'd snap your ponchos together and you'd mix a, a tent-type structure, mm -hmm. and that was okay. called a hooch. And, uh, and the, uh, the, the, there was a fellow, it was like, an, I guess it must have been an odd number of people in my squad mm -hmm. because uh, there was a guy that didn't have a buddy, so I buddied up with him, a guy from Baltimore. Mm -hmm. And um, so we, we buddied up and, and made a hooch. And, uh, so part of this hooch, now I, a lot of people, they'll see it on TV or they'll see it in movies where, you know, they'll cut down the timbers and they'll make the frames and stuff yeah. like that. Actually, is that actually, I can show you a picture of a hooch. Okay. In the background right there. Okay. Now, I'll, is it okay if I hold it up to the camera? Okay. So this is what he's talking about that's, in the background. And and on my uh, and on my you. on my shirt, yeah, on my shirt right there is my CIB. That's the day I was awarded my CIB. And for those who don't know what a CIB is, what is that? Combat infantryman's badge means you've okay. you've been shot at or you've served a certain period of time in a combat zone. Okay. See, okay. And uh, actually. <laughs> uh huh. Young, fresh faced. <laughs> Got yourself a cool beverage there. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, what what are you what are your duties when you if you have a day to day? Like, is there anything that's consistent, or is it ever changing? Or what what what's a typical day when you get out to guard this bridge or or, or beyond? What what's what's okay? A typical well, day? The, the the typical day guarding the bridge is uh, you're you're assigned a guard rotation uh, to walk the bridge. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you, we had uh, we had concussion grenades, and what we would do while when we walked the bridge, you know, at random, we would just throw a concussion grenade in the river just in case mm. somebody was trying to swim up and plant okay. a charge or do whatever. Because this this was a major north south route. This was Route One, okay. the major north south route mm -hmm. in Vietnam, and there's a lot of military and civilian traffic that that crossed that bridge every day. Mm -hmm. So uh, checkpoint established. Uh, there was really no no checkpoint per se, okay. but just just uh, just walking the bridge. Your eyes and, open, yeah, right? yeah, and uh, and then at nighttime we had to run uh, what they called uh, LPs or listening posts. Mm, okay. And uh, there, before we went out into the bush, uh, is I spent my first night outside the wire, and uh, with uh, three other guys, mm -hmm. and the four of us went out uh, after dark and. And uh, you know, one of the, whoever was in charge of that little fiasco, <laughs> you know, picked a spot as a shell crater or something, and we climbed into it. And uh, we had we had a radio, and uh, and you know, every so often we'd get a call from inside the the, the uh, CP group there and wanting for a, a, a sit rep, a situation report. Mm -hmm. And what you'd do is, if everything was okay, you'd you'd hit your uh, your mic twice, you you break squelch twice, and that tells them everything's okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, but uh, it, it really scared me that night because one of the one of the old boys that was out there with us liked to snore, <laughs> and, <laughs> and of course I'm sure it sounded ten times louder than it really was. But right. he, he'd start snoring and I'd start beating on him and <laughs> wake him up. Because <laughs> if you're hearing it, someone else is hearing it. <laughs> but that was the, that was Not my place to be a snore. That was my first time out outside the wire there, mm. so. Uh, and how long would, would that rotation usually last? Oh, well, that was, you, you know, all night. You went out okay, all so night. Okay, so it was a full night then? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you came back in after daylight in the morning. And, uh, 
Did you uh, participate in any combat operations? Oh yeah, yep. Can you, uh, you remember your first one? Well, I remember, I don't, More significant I, don't one? I don't, well, the first, <laughs> hmm. my first significant rec recollection of, of a company sized patrol just out in what, you know, a lot of times they called it Indian country, you know. <laughs> So we were, uh, yeah, we, our whole 120-man company was, was uh, on patrol uh, out in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, my platoon uh, was, uh, you, we had, uh, you know, four platoons in the company. And my, my platoon was the, in, in the pecking order, we were the last platoon, mm -hmm. okay. My squad was the last squad. And I was, my position, I was assigned a position for that little, little episode and I was walking what they called right flank drag mm -hmm. which meant that you had you had the main body of the company mm -hmm. and then out on the flanks you had people walking okay yep. all right I was the last individual in the whole cotton picking mess on the right flank you were it I was I was the last guy right wow. and so I was trying to remember my training you know and, and you know the the train is uh, hedgerows and scrub brush and and you know tall grass and so anyway, I'm trying to remember my training, and I'm, you know, the guy in front of me. I don't want to be too close to him. I don't want to be too far away from him. I will keep him in, you know. So that's what I'm doing, you know. And he walks up to this hedgerow, and stops. So so I keep my distance and I stop. And um, and I'm waiting and I'm waiting and he's still standing there and I'm waiting and I so I finally decide I'm going to go up and see what's going on, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I approach the guy in front of me. And I said, what's happening? He says, well, so-and-so uh, went in that hooch over there and I'm waiting for him to come out. And I said, well, if he hadn't come out yet, maybe we better go over there and check on him. Mm. So we did, we walked over there and there's not a soul there. Mm. And we don't even know where the company is. Oh boy. Yeah, we're, we're, <laughs> we're by ourselves. Uh -huh. At the edge. <laughs> So what, and, you just walk in and walk through and keep going? Yeah, we just wandered around until we finally found him. I mean, and, and oh, I mean, we're out in the middle of nowhere, and I remember old Papa Son up at one of the hooches, and he's looking at us like, what are you boys doing wandering around out here, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but so that, that, that was one of my first recollections of, <laughs> of being out on the road. Reality crept in real quick, and it's like, <laughs> we're the only two here now. Yeah, yeah. So, well, and luckily you found, you found yep. the rest of them. Yeah. Oof, that's... It makes you tighten up a little bit. A, a little bit, I would imagine, yes. Mm -hmm. So did anything? So that at that patrol, did did you guys encounter anything? Did no. you get you got to where you were going and yeah, we just, pretty uneventful? Right, and and the way we way we would operate is you know we're just we're we're out we're you know when we're in an area we we're given a coordinates. Mm -hmm. I mean at that time I'm just a a rifleman. I think I was assigned to a machine gun team. I carried extra ammo for the gunner, mm -hmm. and but anyway we had a, we had an area to work, and then you know at night. Uh, it's just kind of like it's kind of like old west, you know. You circle the wagons, you know. You form a circle and you dig in and you put out your and I, your claymore mines and your trip flares and you know some guys are going out on LPs and some guys are going out on ambushes and, and that's just the way we operated until somebody decided to hey you know you, we need you to go over here and do the same thing. So you know one day you'd, you'd you know a couple of days you know you'd you'd get the word go well get ready for the choppers they're going to come pick you up and. So choppers would come in and pick us up, and we'd be flying around up there for circling around and everything, and saying, "Well, I wonder where we're going to land." And they, well, they said, "They told us, well, just watch for the artillery barrage. That's where we're going." So, Great. Because uh, usually, what would happen is they would prep the area with artillery, mm -hmm. and then we would we would come in, and then you know, as we're getting closer, the the artillery would would stop, and the, the door gunners would open up and start spraying trees and bushes and ravines and you know sometimes the gun sh gunships would be with us and you know if they needed to prep something they would and mm -hmm. and uh, that was that was referred to as an aerial combat assault mm -hmm. and that's uh, that's how I earned my air medal uh, even though I was uh, light weapons infantry mm -hmm. uh, we did so many aerial combat assaults that we earned air medals. How many would you would you think that you did? I have no idea. But I know I was only in country three months when my air medal orders were cut. Wow! And okay. that's and that's what this is. Mm -hmm. The the blue and yellow one is the air medal. Yeah. Very nice. Mm -hmm. So it, it would not be typical for an infantryman to get one of those. No, no. But we were air mobile. Right. First Cav. I'm I'm not aware of any other right. <laughs> infantry unit that received air medals. So, so it's a it's a cov it's coveted as far you know. Yep. It's, yeah. Yeah. 
Outstanding. But that was that was our our method of operation. You know, okay. we they would drop us here for a few days and they'd pick us up. They'd drop us here for a few mm -hmm. days and you know that's we were continuously working like that. Okay. And uh, and and then of course uh, time frame wise, um, I was still in the Central Highlands there in that general area when the '68 Tet started. Okay. Yeah. So that, how did you guys get word of that? Uh, just over the radio. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, the the one good thing about being out in the boonies when it started was that, that you know, during when Tet started, you know, it was the focus was on LZs and base camps and mm -hmm. all this kind of stuff. We were just out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> now, did they redeploy you to an area that was being hit for that, or uh, did you no, kind of sit ten we, out? We on just the side? we just kind of kept uh, working our area because we figured. They, I guess the the thought process was that these units that were hitting these places would be moving, mm -hmm. and we were to interdict. You know, any of that kind of stuff. I mean, but all along, even before Tet started, we we had this one area called the 506 Valley there. That it, it was crazy. We'd go, they'd send us up this same mountain about just about every day to set up an ambush and mm. get to the top of it. And they set up an ambush, and just about every day, you know, they'd get three or four come over the top of the mountain and they'd blow them away. And you know, just but it just get got to be repetitious, you know. Sure, but, uh, sure. Like go oh, this again. Yeah, here we go again, and, and and those people aren't dumb, you know. We, you can't do that, but so many times they catch on, you know. Right. So I, I do remember one day they sent us up there, sent my platoon up there, and uh, and there were several trails to get to the top, and this one trail was was not a very good approach. It, part of it was in like a ravine, mm -hmm. and you had high ground on both sides of you, and uh, and and again, <laughs> again that day I was walking drag. I was the last man <laughs> in the platoon. And, uh, and then I hear these gunshots up up ahead, and uh, you know they say, "Well, well, we, we something's going on up here." So, and I could hear the um, our, our our thirty man platoons only had for communications. We only had two radios for the thirty man platoon. The lieutenant would have one, and the platoon sergeant would have one, and and uh, they usually had squawk boxes on them, speakers on them, so you could kind of hear what was going on sometimes. And and uh, so anyway. <laughs> A lot of commotion going on, and you know everybody looking around to see what's what's happening, and and whatever's happening is up in the front of the column there, and um, and I remember hearing the, the company commander was down at the foot of the mountain. He wasn't with us up there, and, and he was saying flank them, flank them, and finally, finally our platoon leader, Lieutenant uh, Lieutenant Ski, gets gets on the horn and says, "Sir, I think we ought to get the hell off of here," <laughs> and we did. <laughs> we turned it around, and of course coming off, I'm the last man still up there. <laughs> so, <laughs> Wow. But uh, but we came off of there and uh, and and I think uh, I think Lieutenant and the company commander had probably had a few words over that and uh, mm. and um, but just sort of a I'll give you sort of like a Paul Harvey thing the rest of the story <laughs> okay it was sometime after that you know maybe week two weeks I don't know whatever you know we were we were working in another part of the 506 and. Um, and uh, just before just before dark, uh, some observation shoppers had spotted something back in that area where we had been working, mm -hmm. right? And so during the night, the artillery was called in and was coming in on on a certain area there. And uh, so we, were, I guess, we were the closest company. So the next day, we were we were supposed to go check it out, but they said, well, we can't, we can't, you know, it's it's going to be socked in in the morning. We can't we can't give you choppers to to move you over there. So. Mm -hmm. So uh, the decision was made that we were going to walk, and and they had this. It was called the reason the area was called a 506 was it was a, it was a, called a 506 highway, but it was nothing but a dirt road. <laughs> and so anyway, about uh, I guess about 2:30 in the morning, we get up and and get on the road, and we take off to to go back to this area. And uh, and just where we're supposed to turn off the road and and hit a trail to go go up into that vicinity, uh, they called a halt, and and while they called a halt, uh, a couple of uh, I don't know if they were Viet Cong or Envy. I don't know what they were, but anyway, a couple of enemy came down the trail, mm -hmm. and uh, and our lieutenant and my squad leader and our point man were in a huddle, right right at that juncture, and uh, so the the Vietnamese you know called out in in Vietnamese you know, mm -hmm. and when they did, uh, the, our three guys opened up and mm -hmm. uh, took care of them. But so that slowed us down. They had to call a chopper in to take them out and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, what I'm getting at is when we got up there to check that area out, we found a bunker complex. 
Mm. And and one of our platoons actually found a 51 caliber machine gun that had been abandoned. Wow. <laughs> so, I mean, we could have gotten into all kinds of trouble up there. Right. But, uh, Which obviously it had been there yep. while you were there. And yes. Like we, we, were, we were all over that place multiple times and nothing happened. Well, and that and that's the kind of one of the main things that you hear, or the themes you hear about Vietnam is is the, the the denseness of the jungle. Somebody could be a foot and a half away from you, and you may never see them. Same yeah. thing with those those complexes, those bunker mm -hmm. complexes yeah. and stuff. Um, did you ever get into any um, or find any of the tunnels or the tunnel systems while you were there? Well, no, to my knowledge, I, I never saw any one of our guys go into a tunnel. Okay. I mean, you know, our our and and it was a waste. It was a waste of munitions, but typically, if you saw something like that, you just threw a hand grenade in it. But, okay. but we all know it was just a waste of time to do mm -hmm. that. But, uh, right. Yeah. Um, so the, Viet the 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 war in Vietnam it was real on, re really the first, you know, major conflict that we were in, where it was the, you know it was televised. Yeah. Um, where you know people back home they're they're watching the war almost almost live in front of them. Did you did you encounter any any film crews or did did you get no. any, any kind of any no. mov, movie cameras or anything in there? No, never never got any never no. encountered anything like that. No. Okay. Um, how did you how did you keep in touch? So you you got married before you left. Were yep. you able to keep in pretty good contact back home? Oh yeah, we had uh, one another good thing about the cab. You know, being there mobile, we had our own support choppers. We didn't have to rely on other units to help us in that regard. So we got pretty good resupply, and, and mail was pretty steady. Okay. And so we were able to write letters home and get mail and and that type of thing. Yeah. Okay, so you were able to get and receive and yep. put, stay at least relevant and and and. and C current yeah. back at home okay yeah um so also with vietnam it was you know it was a lot easier to, to get on the telephones and stuff and call home um well from what I, I hear if you were in the main areas well you course, being out in the bush of course the majority of the people in vietnam were support people yeah i mean it's, it's always been my understanding that for every person like me that was out in the boonies there was at least 10 other people mm -hmm you know, in a base camp somewhere doing a support service. Right, right. So, you know, the only the only time I called home in, in that whole 12 month period was uh, was from Clark Air Force Base, Philippines, telling my wife I'd been wounded. Okay. Can you, will you care to talk about, I noticed you have your purple heart on your, yeah. on your hat. Do you, you want to talk I, about that? I, I can elaborate on that. We, um, you know, being air mobile, uh, the first cav was, was called upon to move around a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, while Tet was going on, uh, the CAV packed up and moved from the Central Highlands, which was in two core area. We moved to I Corps area up near the DMZ in the Marine Territory. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, so let's see. While we were up there, um, I guess the main one of the main things that that, that stands out to me up north was on in early April. Uh, April the 3rd, 1968, my unit pr flew in and, and began participating in something called Operation Pegasus. Um, that was when the Marines were having a bad time at a place called Quezon. And um, the Marine, uh, first cab was called upon to uh, uh, go in and help relieve them. And, uh, so we, we flew in to Part of the CAV came in on Highway 9 on foot, and part of us flew in and went into surrounding mountaintops mm -hmm. and set up LZs. And uh, our, for our first day in, um, the mountaintop they put us on had like 10-foot elephant grass on it. So mm -hmm. when we when we jumped off the skids, we, <laughs> we didn't know where we were going to land. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, they were they, the first thing they had us doing was was clearing the elephant grass and nobody was digging foxholes and mm -hmm. so while this was going on we uh, uh, suffered a uh, rocket attack and uh, the, the fellow that I buddied up with when I first got there got killed mm -hmm. and uh, but uh, but anyway after after we finished up at Quezon we were in there about a month and uh, actually pulled us out on marine helicopters and flew us into a marine camp called, at a place called Dung Ha. And um, we spent one night in there, and the next morning we got on choppers and headed north. <laughs> mm. <laughs> and uh, we were working two companies together with our sister company, Bravo Company. I was with Charlie Company. Mm. And uh, so we're, we're working up there, and uh, uh, 
the, the terrain was just as flat as the floor here mm -hmm. and wide open and um, it's kind of sandy and uh, so one platoon from Bravo Company was sent out about a thousand meters, they called it a click, mm -hmm. to uh, see about where we were going to set up the next night and they got into some sand dunes and scrub brush and, and got hit with small arms and, and incoming. And uh, so their company commander and, uh, and another one of their platoons saddled up and, and went out to, to help them out. Well, we're, we're, sitting, we're sitting back at our, our position the night before, you know, we're sitting back there smoking and joking and listening to all the explosions and gunfire and black smoke and all that mm -hmm. stuff, saying, my God, man, I'm glad I'm not out there in that mess, okay? <laughs> well, the next thing you know, they say 2-6 saddled up. Well, 2-6 was my platoon, mm -hmm. and we had to get our gear and walk out there. And, just where you said you didn't want to be. Just where we said we didn't want to be. And um, the the bottom line of that little fiasco, this this was Mother's Day, May the 12th, 1968. Mm -hmm. And um, in a very short period of time, um, the total, our, our total casualties for that whole thing was four killed and 44 wounded. And my 30-man platoon alone suffered 17 wounded, you know, and I was one of the 17 wounded and ended up in a hospital in Japan for a while. Okay. Was it due to, was it small arms, was it a rocket? Um, some kind of shrapnel. Shrapnel, okay. Yeah, I don't know Explosion if it was, somehow. we were so close to the DMZ, it wasn't funny, I don't know if it was mortar or artillery or what the heck it was, but just some kind of shrapnel. Okay. Yeah, got me in the lower part of my back. Okay. So how long did you spend over there in Japan? Well, Let's see, I, my total time out of the field was about two months. Uh, okay. I, I, I walked back into my, I actually lucked out. When I, it's kind of silly, when I, was, when I was over in the hospital, you know, these guys are saying, hey man, you, you know, if you're gone too long, they can send you back anywhere. They don't send you back where you came from. And I said, oh man, mm -hmm. I said, I, wanna, I, I don't want to go anywhere but where I was. Right. So I started bugging my doctor. I said, when am I going to get out of here? So anyway, when I finally got out, I managed to get all the way back to my outfit, back into the same platoon. Awesome. And um, but I, I, like I say, I was wounded on the 12th of May, and I, I walked back into my platoon uh, first or maybe you know, sec maybe around the second week of July. Mm. And and the crazy thing was is. Uh, you know, Vietnam was, uh, you know, all of us guys went over as replacement. It was like a, I mean, a constant rotation. You know, people coming, people going home every week or two. Right. And so I've, I've been away from my outfit for, for two months. You know, I walk back in, and there we're in the mountains there in I Corps someplace, and I walk in and report to the lieutenant, which is a new person, and the platoon sergeant's a mm. new person. There's a lot of new faces. and. And uh, I'd only been in country for five months, you know, when I was hit. And I was actually, uh, at the time, I was a team leader. And I was actually setting in for my squad leader the day I got hit. He had mm. left, he was on R&R &R at the time. Mm. And so anyway, uh, so I'd only been in country five months. So I come back and, and the lieutenant looks at me and he says, oh, he says, we heard you were coming back. He said, you're an old timer now. He said, you're the squad leader of second squad. They're, they're right over there. And uh, here I am, I'm a, I'm a 20 year old E4 being put in an E6 slot. And, wow. Um, with five months experience. With five months experience. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So now you're the guy in charge of, of this group yeah, of guys. Of my what, squad. How, yeah. how do you? I mean, obviously you got to come to grips with that real quick. What 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 do you what do you do? What do you say to these guys? <laughs> because you're <laughs> probably as young as they are. They're probably you're probably oh, same yeah. age and you yeah. know. Well, and, and, and here's, here's the rub, too. I mean, you, you don't think about it at the time, but uh, uh, several years ago, back around 2006 or something, I found that my company that I served with was having military reunions, which was awesome. Uh -huh. and, and that allowed, I started attending those and, and reconnected with some of the people I served with over there, one of which was, was my lieutenant when I first got there. Oh, wow. And, and, and what I didn't realize at the time was, here, here's a guy, he's, he's, a, he's a lieutenant in charge of a 30-man infantry platoon, and he's only 21 years old. Yeah. I mean, come on. Yeah, and you, you wonder, how does this happen? Yeah. You know? Yeah. But it's, you know, it's one of those things is, you know, you, you grow up real quick and you learn real fast. Yep. Yeah. Very good. 
Well, and, and, and you know, I can, I can give you a little example, I guess, of, of the maturing factor on that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I had indicated I was working for the local phone company when I was drafted. Well, mm -hmm. I had been there right out a year, and, and they're big on annual appraisals, okay? And I can remember my boss, you know, I can remember some verbiage from my very first appraisal, you know, many, mm -hmm. many years ago. And I remember my boss telling me, he says, says, Tom, you don't ask enough questions. And when someone tells you something, it's like it goes in one ear and out the other. You got to do better. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I'm going for two years <laughs> and I come back to my job, right? Mm -hmm. Who do I end up working for? That same man. And within a year, he's given me accelerated raises. So, yeah, I mean, you, 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 you have to, you, you have to grow up like that and you have to become that. And I'm sure he, you came back and said, he, you were not the, you were not the, you were not the boy who left. You were the man who came back. Obviously. Yeah. Um, very interesting. Did you guys have, uh, I mean, uh, being with the, with the cab, you're, you're moving around all the time. Any any downtime? Any R and R time? Any any time that you can remember? <laughs> well, I, I did get an R and R. Mm -hmm. uh, matter of fact, I um, after I got back from the hospital, I got you know I, I came back in July and in September, uh, I got an R and R and I met my wife in Honolulu for a week and that oh, was nice. that was awesome. <laughs> Great, it must have been. Uh, like... But then then there's a downside to that too. I mean, then you got to go back. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I mean, I flew into Vietnam three times in a year, and every oh, time I flew in, it was, you know, I knew more about what to expect, mm -hmm. and, and that was, uh, that was hard. That yeah. was hard. Sometimes I think they, there is something to be said about not knowing what's go, what's in front of you. Yeah. Ignorance is bliss. Ignorance is bliss. Yes. yes. Uh, but also, it's good to know because you kind of avoid certain mistakes. Yeah. I used to always tell people you could tell the new guys in the old timers because they dug the deepest foxholes. Mm. Okay, makes sense. Yes. Are there any any when you think back to that time? Is there are there any incidents that stand out more than others? Uh, any a, a particular incident, uh, a feeling, uh, a sound, a smell? Is there anything that really brings you back to that? Well, I. Um, I'm very fortunate that I don't suffer from flashbacks. Uh, I, I know guys that, that have flashbacks and it, to me it's, it, it has to be a very frightening experience. Mm -hmm. um, what, what I kind of have is, is called intrusive memories. Uh, it, it's hard to, and, and I can't really explain what instigates the thought, mm -hmm. but it's like, uh, it's, it's just like, you know, at random, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll remember something, you mm -hmm. know, a, a, an incident or a day or a, right. a person or, and uh, just, it's, it's almost like there's no rhyme or reason to it. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but, you know, you, 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 but you do have a tendency to dwell on how you ended up being lucky enough to come home. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure it, it's probably that gets exasperated when you go to these reunions and you talk to your other to the, to the other guys, and it, it's probably a common feeling. Yeah, but it, it helps. Mm -hmm. It helps. You know, when 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 we came back from Vietnam, all that stuff was buried. Um, you know, you didn't talk to anybody about mm -hmm. where you'd been or what you'd been doing or anything. It was years, years before any of that stuff started coming out. Mm -hmm. And it's 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 a shame that you it it, it wasn't talked about earlier because it probably could have made things a little bit easier. Yeah, I think so. Um, so I saw your your uh, your uh, badge on the side there. Uh, the CIB? Yep. Or? You re receive anything, any other medals or anything, any other awards while you were over there? Uh, well, the, yeah, I, I have, you know, the Purple Heart is, is the highest yeah. and then and then my Air Medal and, mm -hmm. and I, I, I was uh, it wasn't a valor award, but I do have an Army Commendation Medal. And, uh, for a yeah. Is that for, for a specific a, incident? No, no, it's just okay. for meritorious okay. service. You know, so. And did you you spent a you spent a full year over there? Uh, in, including my hospital time, yeah, I was there December '67 to December '68. Okay. And uh, I know I I got uh, I hadn't been home long, and I actually wrote a letter back to a guy in my squad, mm. and. Uh, it was a while before I, I got a response. I got a response and he was in a hospital out in the Midwest 
And he told me, he says, Tom said, it's a good thing you left when you did. He says, you hadn't been gone no time till we walked into a bunker complex that wasn't empty. Mm. And a lot of guys got messed up. And, mm. you know. But during my time as a squad leader, none of my guys got hurt. That is my, ma my, my major accomplishment there. That is so. an accomplishment. And it, due to good leadership, I'm sure. Luck. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Pure old unadulterated luck. Yeah. yeah so. Hey, you know what? A lot of people say, I'd rather be lucky than good. Yep. I I'm, 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 a firm, I'm a firm believer in mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, so when you're over there, I mean, again, I, I, I take some, some, grab some things from, you know, when you see in movies and TV. You know, it's the countdown. Hey, I'm, I'm this time short, I'm this time short. <laughs> oh, I had my short timers calendar. <laughs> I'm sure, as everyone does. So when you start to get towards that that goal, um, I've talked to some guys that say it changes you. You, you. you become, either you either become very cautious or you just say what's going to happen is going to happen and you just go full bore. With me, I think it was, it was you become more cautious. I okay. think the, the guys, from my perspective, the guys in the middle of their tours are, are more careless mm -hmm. uh, about things, and and as they get short, then they become more more cautious and kind mm -hmm. of think things through a little further. And, right. Uh, because so, I mean, it, it was, you know, it, it wasn't like you know the previous wars. It wasn't like you know World War One, World War Two. Where I mean, if you went there, and you knew you're going to be there until you die. Mm -hmm. or you're going to win this thing, okay, right. then it's a whole lot different atmosphere and a whole lot different mindset mm -hmm. than, than a young drafted person being sent into a conflict. And, and once, you, once you get it in your head that, hey, man, all I got to do is stay alive for 12 months and I'm going home. Right. Now, just think about that for a minute, you know. Sometimes that's harder. Yep. Because you know, but you know the end date. So when your end date is coming up, or you you know when you're supposed to be leaving, um, what what what's your lead up to 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 that day? Trying to relinquish responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> How well did that go? <laughs> oh, it was it was getting pretty tight. I, I finally the last the last few days I was in the field before I got to leave the field. I. I relinquished the command of my squad to someone else, and I started walking in the middle of the pack. <laughs> <laughs> Smart move. <laughs> uh, um, so, when, how, when, when your your time, you know, I guess, is there a transition period between, you know, being and then going home? Do you, do you go somewhere, or is this like, hey, this is You're, this is day about three sixty five? I'm gone. You no, know, it's you know typically. At least in in my unit, it, it seemed like you you know they if you were lucky if you got pulled out of the field a week before you were supposed mm. to leave, and then you go back to like a division base camp for what they call out processing, mm -hmm. you know where you're turning in your rifle and you're checking you know checking all the boxes mm -hmm. and you know yeah. Hard thing or difficult thing to turn that rifle in? Uh no, it wasn't a hard thing. Yeah. Okay. It, it, yeah. <laughs> Take it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. Right, right. Forget <laughs> me on that. Get me on that plane. Get me exactly. out of here. <laughs> so did you out? Did you leave from the same place you came in? Yeah. You did. Okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I processed through a uh, uh, called Camp Radcliffe at uh, On K, which was our division base camp. When I went over, that's where I out processed, mm -hmm. and then uh, and then was transported to back to Cameron Bay, and you know for more processing and, and coming home. Okay. What, what was your homecoming like? Uh, well, uh, I was fortunate uh, they, they uh, really hadn't got into, into harassing the returnees yet. And I think that was more in, I got a feeling that was more like if you came back home through California. I came back through Fort Lewis, Washington. Okay. And, um, you know, there, it, was, it was just, it was uneventful. It was no, you know, nobody ridiculing you or doing anything like it was later on. I think that was December 68. I think as you got more into uh, more into 69, there was a lot more war protests and, and a lot more uh, of that kind of stuff going on. So right. I, I was fortunate that I didn't experience anything like that. That's good. Um, so how long, how long were you in Washington State? Oh, just a day or something. Okay. I mean, it wasn't much time at all. And then, then we were turned loose and you know, I got, a, got an air, airplane ticket to, to get home. And I, again, I had another 30, about a 30 day leave. And, uh, flew into uh, BWI in Baltimore and uh, 
-hmm. and uh, was met by my wife and and people and so forth and then and then after my leave I had to report into uh, Fort Jackson South Carolina I still had six months to pull active duty mm -hmm. you know so. okay so what are you doing down there for that six months <laughs> well and that was that was a little embarrassing also uh, <laughs> uh, I was promoted to uh, sergeant e5 uh, before I came home okay and um, uh, but the hard copy of the orders hadn't come out yet. I was promoted in November and came home in early December. <laughs> and um, so even when I was out processing, I went to the Division IG office to confirm my promotion. And I was told that, yes, you are promoted. Yes, go ahead and wear your stripes. Uh, we will send copies of your orders to your uh, home leave address, and we will send copies of your orders to your next duty station. <laughs> well, that didn't happen. So here I am reporting into Fort Jackson, South Carolina, wearing buck sergeant stripes and can't prove it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, sure, I'm sure they were okay with that. <laughs> well, no, they processed me in as an E4. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, get, I get to my, uh, my assignment, and I talk to the first sergeant, and I told him my story, and he says, he said, don't wait for the Army to get a copy of those orders. He says, when you get home this evening, you sit down, and you write your old first sergeant in Vietnam a letter and ask him to send you a copy of those orders. Mm -hmm. And I got a copy of those orders back from Vietnam before the Army did. Not surprising though, was Not it? Not surprising. So I ended, up, I ended up getting lucky. I was assigned to a basic training outfit, okay. but I got a job in battalion headquarters as battalion driver. <laughs> okay. That's not <laughs> and, bad. No, it wasn't bad. I would take the uh, battalion commander and the XO and people, you know, take them out to training sites if they wanted to go see mm -hmm. uh, troops training and uh, take the uh, uh, battalion sergeant major around in the morning to check the areas and, and that type of stuff. I had to, you know, not just driving them out, but I had to know where those places were and who was where, when. So if you know if the if the uh, CEO came out and said I want to go see Bravo Company at ten o'clock I needed to know where Bravo Company was at ten o'clock. Right. Uh, but it was it was a good job. At least I wasn't pushing the troops. So. Right. And and my wife and I uh, actually rented a little trailer off post. I didn't even live on post. Oh, even better. Yeah. So when when you're back down and down there, you're 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 someone who's done their time over in country. You're seeing these guys who haven't gone yet. Mm -hmm. Is that a is that, a, is that a, what kind of dynamic is that? I mean, do you, do you talk to them? Do you, are you no, allowed to impart no. any kind and, of and, and again, on them? And again, again, by working in battalion headquarters and being the driver, I'm not out yeah. on the company level with okay. the trainees. Mm -hmm. But you know, but when I see them in formation and everything, you, know, you, you kind of wonder, well, what's what's going to happen to these right. guys down the road? You know, where in are your they heart, because you know what they're you know what they're in for. Yeah. Yeah. How has your wartime experience affected your life? Oh, well, it matured me. I, I mean, we, we've already been there. Uh, but, you know, I, I for years I, I denied having PTSD. I would never even, never even considered it. I always, my, my concept of someone with PTSD was you know, a person that, that was married multiple times and couldn't hold a job and had drinking problems and drug problems and all this kind of stuff, and, and that wasn't me. And I would go to my military reunions and, and, and all the guys there would say, hey man, have you filed for PTSD yet? And I said, I don't have that stuff, you know. And um, finally, about three years ago, uh, I went to a reunion and, uh, and actually uh, got to really talking to a guy and found out that, uh, you know, he was, he was there after me. He was there about a year later than me. We, but we both, because the reunion is, is the, on a company level, but for the whole duration of the war. So there was guys that did their thing before I got there and guys that did their thing after I came home. But then there's the guys I overlapped with. Right. Well, this was an overlap guy. And I found out that, that he lived right over in Silver Spring, Maryland, which is close by. And, and you know, we got to talking about stuff. And, and he told me about a vet center in uh, Silver Spring and said, you need to go uh, see the director of that vet center. He can help you. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I relinquished and made an appointment and, and went and talked to this individual. And, and uh, we had a couple of, couple of meetings and I'd be sitting there and he'd be asking me questions and he was sitting there typing on a computer. I had no clue what he was doing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and after, after a couple of sessions, he, he handed me a paper one day and he said, sign this. And what he was doing was, was he was uh, uh, sending in paperwork, uh, sending in a claim for me to claim PTSD. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, went, I went through the process. Uh, I talked to the psychologist. I 
answered everything as honestly as I possibly could. And um, make a long story short, they said they said I had PTSD. So. And you never felt, but you never felt like you did. Well, I, I knew I knew I didn't like crowds. I you know I didn't you know, a lot of things I didn't like. And I, my wife had told me for years that I never showed emotion and just just different little things that right. uh, that I always brushed off. And uh, but I think yeah, that's part of it. So I mean, good thing good thing your buddy got you to go. Yeah. So now I do participate in a counseling group weekly. And okay. With a bunch of old 70 plus year old Vietnam vets and <laughs> <laughs> sit around talking bull. Well, and and it's not a, it's not a war story thing. It's yeah. just I mean we talk about everything under the sun, you know, mm -hmm. current events and just all kinds of stuff. But just things are all related. You can it's all relatable things yeah. to each other. Yeah. And I'm sure as well, much. Well, and even even our counselor, our counselor, was a Marine in Vietnam and lost a leg. Mm. And he himself is 70 years old. So I mean, uh, you know, he. Uh, but all the rest of us are army in the same age bracket and mm -hmm. Vietnam vets, and so it's it's good. You you bring that you but you bring that commonality to each other where you know, you you all you understand what each other's going through because you you've experienced a lot of the same things. Mm -hmm. um, and as as much as you know, as much as they have helped you, you have to know that as much how you've helped all those others. I hope. I hope. Matter of fact, I just, uh, I still keep in touch with that lieutenant uh, oh, wow. that was a year older than me. I, mm -hmm. I, matter of fact, I talked to him recently. His, he lost his wife in the last several months and he's been having a hard time. And, and I, I told him, I said, you know, if you need to talk, I said, call me anytime. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I got a call. And, uh, and we had a serious conversation. And the next time I talked to him, he says, well, I've got a I've got an appointment with a psychologist, and I'm, I'm going to start counseling, and then on this and that and the other thing. So yeah. Very good. Would you, drawing from your military experience, would you, would you recommend someone, a young person nowadays, enter military service? What, what are your thoughts on by entering all, military? By all means, my grandson, my grandson, uh, last year uh, was discharged from the service after spending five years. And I told him, I said, you know, nothing wrong with going in the Army. I said, but you need to get into something that's going to benefit you when you get out. And he listened to Grandpa, and, and he did. He, he signed up and got into satellite communications. And um, Nowadays, that's it. So he, uh, he did his uh, basic at Fort Jackson, then he went to Fort Gordon, Georgia for eight months of training. Mm. But, but he's got this little wild streak. And uh, <laughs> when he finished his, his communications training, he went to Fort Benning and went to jump school and became airborne. And was assigned to a uh, signal outfit at uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, supporting special operations. Mm -hmm. And so he did some deployments and stuff. But, uh, but after five years, he got out and uh, he went on something called terminal leave one day and started a full-time job with a government contractor the next day using his skills and clearances and so forth and, and that that's what key. he's that's what he's doing today, doing real well. Good thing grandpa talked to him. Yeah. And Good. I pinned his jump wings on him when he graduated from airborne school. Awesome. Proud moment. Yes. Very one of the ones that sticks out. Yes. So say, you know, future generations, your great 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 grandchild is gonna watch this video one day. What's one thing you would want them to know about your military service and your time in the military? No regrets. No regrets. Yeah, it was, it was tough, but um, in a sense, it was. In a sense, it, it probably helped me in the long run. Mm -hmm. you know I mean, with uh, maturing and and so forth. I mean, I mean after. Uh, I mean, I, I look at young people today and I, I really feel kind of sorry for them sometimes and I don't know if it has to do with the parenting or what, but when I was 24 years old, uh, I had already been in and out of the military. I had five years of service with the company I was working for. I was married, had a kid, and bought a house. And how many 24-year-olds do that today? Not enough. Okay. Is there anything that we didn't talk about today or speak about today that you'd like to, you'd like to say, you'd like to mention about your your, your military time or, or or after your military time? I I, I think we've we've mm -hmm. given it a broad brush approach. Um, okay. 
Well, on behalf of the Americans in Wartime Experience and myself personally, I'd like to thank you for sitting down and talking to me. Thank you for your service and welcome home, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it.